Uh, many of you know, and some of you may not, but uh, I was homeschooled after the sixth grade. And for those of you that did not know, it just clicked, didn't it? It's like, that explains it. That's why he is the way he is. But let me tell you, you should never, you should never make fun of homeschool kids. Because they're just going to make fun of your kids in Latin, all right? So don't make fun of homeschool kids. I always liked being homeschooled. I was always ahead of my class. It was always really good for me. Um, but one of the things I did not like about, one of the things I really did not like about being homeschooled is that my parents in our little homeschool academy there at the kitchen table, they made me <clears throat> read a book a week and then write a report about that book every week. And so I found out very, very quickly that the shorter the book, the better. So I read a lot of books by Dr. Seuss. He wrote a lot of books, and he was a doctor, so it is what it is. But I remember one particular book, some of you probably read, probably around middle school. I probably read it around the time I would have been in middle school. That really stuck with me, a book called Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And Fahrenheit 451 is this book that's kind of written about this dystopian future where the government has banned all books, and there are these people that are called firemen, and their job is to go and find these books and then burn these books. And even though the book really is about, you know, the government repression of ideas and all this kind of stuff, it's a book about books. That the idea is that books contain words and words matter. Books contain ideas and ideas have consequences and sometimes they can be very dangerous or very illuminating depending on where you fall. But I don't know if you've thought about it today or not. But if you understand what we are doing here in this church service today, we are here today because of a book. And we are here today primarily to talk about a book. So just think about objectively this exact moment in the story of your life. Think about where you find yourself right now. You're in a church service getting ready to hear a preacher, a pastor, talk to you for maybe not quite, but the better part of an hour about a book. All at an incredibly loud volume. And hopefully, that pastor is going to take this book that was written 2,000 years ago and somehow make it relevant to the things you're thinking about in your life right now. Hopefully, he's going to be faithful to what was said here, but helpful to where you are. But what's more is there's a large portion of the congregation that actually met at 9.30 this morning to talk about a totally different part of this book. And then, believe it or not, there are going to be some people that will be here tonight at 5 o'clock for discipleship training so they can go deeper together in a totally different part of this book. And then at 6 o'clock tonight, we're going to come back through and do all of this again. And the same pastor is going to preach from the same book at a totally different point and preach about something totally unique from this book. And even now, this pastor would tell you that I hope while you listen and take good notes and apply what you hear in this service to your life, you need to read this book every day. You need to read tomorrow. You need to read on Tuesday and Wednesday and then come back on Wednesday night to hear somebody talk about this book again. Not only do you need to read this book, you need to study this book. Not only do you need to study it and read it, but you need to memorize portions of this book. So what's so great about this book? It's just a book, right? It's got pages and chapters and uh, leather cover. That's a little weird, but what's so great about this book? Some of y'all today maybe really don't know what's so great about this book. Like you know the Bible's important, don't you? You know that preachers preach about it, and you know that politicians quote it if they think it's going to help them get some votes. And you know that Paul Paul had a Bible laid up beside his spit cup on the nightstand. But you don't know what the big deal about the Bible really is. Maybe you've even heard people say that the Bible is the Word of God, but you have no idea why they say that. Or maybe you know that's something you're supposed to believe, but you don't know how to defend that, and you don't really understand what all of that means. Maybe you are in the vast majority of people who think that the Bible is important, but if you would be honest, you would think that maybe the Bible is largely irrelevant to you. Or you would think that the Bible is, can I just say it, a little boring, kind of lame. You don't see what the big deal about this book is. Today, we're going to talk about this book, from this book. We're going to see what it says about itself. And here's what the Bible would tell you about itself in one sentence that we're going to try and unpack today. The Bible would tell you it is the Word of God given to you by a work of God to tell you all about the Son of God, which is Jesus. And I want to show you that today from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 14. So take your Bible and turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible with you, the words are on the screen in front of you. 
And if that screen isn't good enough, then you probably got time to download a Bible and pull it up on your phone. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 14. We've been talking on Sunday mornings for the past few weeks about how God makes Himself known. How does He speak to us? Well, the primary thing God has to say to us, as we saw last Sunday morning, is about His Son Jesus. How does God speak to us about Jesus? He does it in the pages of this book. So let's stand together as we honor the Word of God and the God who's spoken in His Word. 2 Timothy 3, 14. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You may be seated. And I trust that the Lord is going to speak to you from and about this book today. Now, the Apostle Paul writes the book of 2 Timothy, and it's his last book. It's his kind of last will and testament, his final word about his life. He writes with a foreboding sense that his life is going to be over. And he even says there in verses 6 through 8 of 2 Timothy 4, he says, I'm ready to be offered. He says, I know that the end is coming. But he writes with a peace that only Jesus can give him. Friend, I hope that you have that same kind of peace today if you're thinking about your own death. And if not, you're going to hear from a brother at the end of our service who lived that experience this past week. But Paul writes knowing that his uh, life is coming to an end. And so he writes to encourage Timothy, whom he calls his son in the faith. And they were not literal flesh and blood father and son, but Paul had invested in Timothy. He had mentored and discipled Timothy so much that he had a spiritual bond with Timothy that was stronger than mere DNA. And Timothy's a pastor. And so this book is one of the pastoral epistles. It's a pastor's heart writing to the next generation of pastors. But Timothy, honestly does not fit the stereotype of what you want in a pastor. Timothy's not very confident. He's not very courageous. Paul even says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, Timothy, I remember your tears. Like the Bible says about Timothy, dude, you're kind of a crybaby, all right? This is not a bold, confident, strong, capable leader. So here's Timothy. With all of that timidity and with all of that anxiety, with his mentor in prison knowing he's about to die, And that mentor writes to him in this book and says to him, Timothy, the time is going to come when people will heap up to themselves teachers who, who have itching ears. And he says, Timothy, the day is going to come when people are going to beg their pastors to lie to them. Is that not amazing? And he says, Timothy, the market for the truth is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so how is Timothy supposed to find encouragement to keep doing what God has called him to do? How's he supposed to find resolve and strength and determination to continue to preach the Word of God to a culture that's going to be more and more hostile to it, knowing that Paul is not going to be around much longer? Well, part of that confidence should come from Timothy's own belief in the power of the Word of God. And that's what Paul's writing to Timothy about in these verses in 2 Timothy 3. He's saying to him, Timothy, it's almost like Paul reaches through this letter, through the Bible, and he says, Timothy, you believe in the clarity of Scripture. You believe in the unity of Scripture. You believe in the authority of Scripture. You believe in the necessity of Scripture. So what else do you have to tell this world except the message that God has revealed in His Word? In other words, to rip off the children's church song, Timothy here, or Paul grabs Timothy and he says to him, Timothy, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for you. It doesn't rhyme, but that's what he tells him here in these verses. So in this kind of really gut-wrenching final letter, Paul encourages Timothy by reminding him, Timothy, your Bible really is the Word of God. But what does it mean for the Bible to be the Word of God? I'm going to try and answer that today by giving you two very, very simple, but very, very important concepts that Paul unfolds in this passage of Scripture. And I'm going to go ahead and warn you today that you may be somewhat disappointed by the excitement level of today's sermon. All right? This is not necessarily going to be terribly thrilling. Nobody's going to get up and run the aisles and grab the Christian flag and wave it around, okay? But if you do want to get excited about things God has said in His Word, then you have to have confidence that this book is the Word of God. 
So that if you do not have confidence that this book is the Word of God, then there's really nothing we can do for you. So where do we get that confidence that the Bible is the book for you? Well, notice the first concept in this text, and that is really Paul writes about the Bible and its divine source. He says in verse number 15, or verse number 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. The story of how you got a Bible in good Alabama English that you can understand is a story of 3,500 years of human history. It encompasses the lives of patriots and pilgrims and prophets and exiles, sinners and saints, historians, all who wrote down the words that you have in the Bible. There's men who wrote the Bible, they finished writing some 2,000 years ago, and then the story would shift to, to priests and sometimes even popes and pastors and scholars and church councils who took, talked among themselves about what should be included and thought of as the Word of God. It involves the stories of martyrs like William Tyndall who gave his life under the reign of Henry VIII in England saying the English people need a Bible that they can understand. And it includes today scholars that translate from Greek and Hebrew into the English language and even people who run Bible bookstores and people who drive trucks with Bibles on them to get them to where they go and missionaries who fly Bibles all over the world and if nothing else it involves the people who program those things for the app store. But for Paul... He says that it all starts, in verse 16, with God who breathes His Word out. He says the Bible is the product of the breathing out of God. Now, if you have a copy of the King James, I'm not sure about the New King James, but the King James says that all Scriptures are given by inspiration of God. And I like that word inspiration because that's the theological concept we're talking about here. The doctrine of inspiration. But the word inspiration does mean to... Breathe out. Translations are right as well. So what, what is Paul talking about? That God has breathed out Scripture. Well, think about it like this. If you really want to make yourself known, your expectations, your desires, uh, your wishes, if you really want to make your heart and your mind known, you're going to use your words to do that, right? I'm hungry. Let you know something about me. Seriously, I am hungry. But I'll tell you that, that lets you know something about me, young lady, you be home by 11. You're communicating through your words. You're breathing your words out into the world. Breathing your heart, your will, your mind, your promises out into the world. So let's do an experiment. I want everybody to take your hand and put it right in front of your mouth. Y'all look really weird doing that. All right, now, I want all of you to say a word that you should be saying in church anyway. Say the word hallelujah. When you did that, did you feel that rush of hot breath on your hand? It's kind of gross, isn't it? But that's what you're doing when you speak. You are breathing words out into the world. What Paul is saying is that the Scripture is God breathing His Word out into the world. It is God speaking into the world. God breathing His heart, His will, His promises, His law, His covenants, His expectations out into this world. So how in the world did God do that when these people wrote the Bible? Well, we don't know. And it was probably different for every author. But the Bible does tell us this in 2 Peter 1.21. It says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That in a way that did not violate their personality or temperament, God overrode them, overshadowed them, so that the words they wrote were the words from their own pen, but were the exact words God wanted them to say. If you are familiar with the Old Testament prophets, you know that many times, begin their messages by saying, Thus saith the Lord. And that's what the Bible is. It is God speaking. Just as God formed Adam in the Garden of Eden and breathed life into him, and the Bible says he became a living soul, God breathed his word into this world and produced a living message that we need to hear today. But understand, when we say that the Bible is inspired in that way, we are not saying that the Bible is inspired in the same way that Shakespeare is inspired. Now, just to be honest with you, I've never got what all the fuss about Shakespeare was about. Just to be totally real with you. But people look at it and they say, this is great literature and it's inspirational. And I get that, but that's not what we're saying. We're not saying that the Bible is just really, really good literature, even though it is, but that it is the product of God. Not man at his best and highest, but God speaking to and through men. Scripture is not just inspired when it speaks to us about inspirational topics like faith and love and forgiveness and hope and salvation, but that the very words that God has given us in the Bible are inspired. 
And with that, let me just hit one common error that I hear Christians a lot say. I want you to understand today that the Bible is not just inspired in places where it speaks to you. And sometimes we read the Bible and talk about the Bible like, well, you know, this, this really meant a lot to me and God spoke to me here. And Friend, every verse, every word is inspired by God, whether you got anything out of it or not when you read it. And even just because, just because you didn't get goosebumps and all tingly when you read it, God was still speaking to you through His Word. So I want you to hear today, publicly, from this church, as the pastor of this church, I want you to know that Sharon Heights Baptist Church believes and preaches and teaches and wants you to know that no matter where you are in life, whatever faith you have, whatever faith you may not have, if you feel like you need forgiveness of your sins, if you feel like you need guidance for a major decision in your life, if you feel like you need comfort for heartbreak, then what you need to do primarily is read your Bible. If you need to hear to you, read your Bible. Say, well, no, 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 I need to hear God speak to me like in an audible way. Then read your Bible out loud. Read your Bible. Don't look around for God to send you secret coded messages and fortune cookies and alphabet soup. Read your Bible and God will speak to you. Because this is the inspired Word of God. But if a perfect God speaks into this world, He's going to do so in a perfect way. So kind of downstream from our belief in inspiration is our belief in the old-fashioned Christian conviction the choir sang about a minute ago of inerrancy. That the Bible is without any error at all. That it is a book that cannot be faulted from cover to cover. Now I know you've probably heard... People say, and you may have even felt like at some point yourself, well, you know, the Bible is just full of contradictions. To which my first question to you would be, is have you ever read the Bible? There are a lot of people that will tell you the Bible is full of contradictions that they've never actually read the Bible. And for somebody to say that the Bible is full of contradictions but they've never read it is kind of like saying that their favorite part of Mark Twain is when Rambo flies in in the helicopter and kills a Terminator. You know? That's the best part of Huck Finn. Man, that's crazy. But if you have read it today, and you do see places that you can't reconcile or things that you have trouble with, here's what you do. You call our church office tomorrow morning, and you schedule a time to take me out to lunch, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that. <laughs> so but what about the meantime? If God inspires this book, and it's a perfect book, and Paul and others are... are thousand years ago, how do I know? I mean, surely we can't... We really wrote, can they? Can we really trust what we... I mean, doesn't the History Channel tell us all the time that there are all these lost books of the Bible that are missing? And Well, no, not really. Uh, because of science that measures the reliability of ancient texts like the Bible. I know this is going to lose some of y'all, but this really is important. It's one of the most important things you can know to defend your faith. And the science of defending ancient texts or, or determining the authenticity of ancient texts is called manuscript evidence. And there are two criteria to determine how accurate copies of ancient texts are. The first is how, how far in proximity or how close in proximity are they to the writings of the original? What is the number of extant copies that are in existence that can be compared together? So for instance... Uh, some of you probably read the Iliad by Homer. Uh, but he was a Greek poet. And uh, scholars would have a level of accuracy and reliability that they know that, that Homer wrote is without doubt that Homer wrote the Iliad and, and wrote what we would read in the Iliad today. There are 643 extant copies of ancient manuscript copies. And they date from about 500 years after Homer lived. Impeccable reliability. But the Greek New Testament has, get this, 5,600 manuscript copies. Coming in at 100 years from the original writings. So that the most reliable, it is a fact of science, that the most reliable document from the ancient world. No scholarly doubt at all about what was written by the authors, and about the Bible that the early Christians read. So that even somebody like Bart Ehrman, whose handsome mug we should have up here for you, Bart Ehrman, a Testament professor at the University of 
appeal. And Bart Ehrman is not a Christian. He was raised a Christian. He does not believe in Jesus, does not believe that the Bible was the Word of God, but is one of the most respected New Testament scholars in the world. When he has freshmen come into his class at the University of North Carolina, Bart Ehrman will absolutely believe they're all good North Carolinians. They all raise their hands and say yes. And then he will tell them by the end of this class, and believe the Bible's Word of God. But even this guy says that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Bart Ehrman will tell you there is no doubt what the writer There is no doubt of the Bible that the early Christians used. The Bible is the most reliable book from the ancient world. There's no question at all. Say, preacher, I don't know if I believe that. Then Google it. And Google proved me right. So I want you to understand today that Jesus himself, Jesus stood and believed the I don't have time to go everywhere where Jesus talked about scripture after Jesus he's always quoting the Bible he's always talking about the Bible he's always defending the Bible as the word of God that people should submit to he's, there's one point where he talks to the Sadducees where he builds his entire argument on one word of the Bible why because he believed it was the word of God well how did we get this Bible, there's 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. What about those lost books? What about the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas and all this kind of stuff? Well, the very early Christians looked at those books and basically said they were hogwash and nonsense. It's the long and short of it. A couple centuries of the life of the Christian church, they looked at these books and said, we have no idea who what they're talking about. Christians don't believe this stuff. And nobody really is reading these much anyway. And so they recognized very early on that those books there was nothing spiritual or significant or authoritative about them. And the reason they are lost is because everybody threw them away. And the reason these aren't is because people have been reading them for 2,000 years. But that doesn't make it easy if you want to go pick out a Bible today, does it? Any bookstore, Barnes and Noble or Books a Million, or if you go to any Bible bookstore, you walk into the five million different kinds of Bibles, aren't there? You got the African American Heritage Study Bible, the Patriot Study Bible, you know, the Single Mom Study Bible, the United States, and you've got the King James, the New King James, the New American Standard, the English Standard, and the Holman Christian Standard, and the Rainbow Study Bible. So it's like you know, the Lego Action Bible. Like what? What kind of Bible should I? By, how do I know? Well, let me just let you peek into the mind of a Bible translator for just a moment, okay? And I'll tell it to you this way. You know, in March, our church is taking a mission trip to Guatemala. And anybody who has ever been to a Spanish-speaking country knows that one of the most important phrases you can know in Spanish is this phrase, Donde está el baño? Which means, where is your bathroom? All right? But you think about that phrase in Spanish. There's a lot of different ways you could take that Spanish phrase and put that in English, right? You could be very technical. Where, where's the toilet? Where's the John? Or wherefore is thine toilet located? Like all these different ways that you could translate that into English, the meaning of the text. All of those are faithful to what the speaker is saying. So, when Bible translators translate from the Greek New Testament from the Hebrew Old Testament... Uh, they come at it sometimes with different approaches. Sometimes they want to be very literal, very formal, very word for word. The King James is very formal. The English Standard Version I've read today is very formal. The New American Standard is incredibly formal. And sometimes they want to be more dynamic. They want to give thought for thought, the meaning of the words. Um, and you would have the New Living Translation would be the most kind of dynamic translation that comes to mind. And translations like the New International Version or the Holman Christian Standard Version. Christian Standard Bible now um, are varying places in the middle. So you say, well, that's all fine and good, but which Bible preacher just tell me what which Bible translation, which one should I use? What's, what's the best? What's hands down the best Bible translation? Read. That's the best. Now I know we're raised like I was in places where they only use the King James and told you to only use the King James. And so every, uh, and that's the way I grew up, so I'm very comfortable and familiar with the language of the King James. Every verse of Scripture I've ever memorized is in the King James. Now, I, I get it. It just makes sense because I've been around it for so long. The King James is like reading Shakespeare. 
it's hard for you to, to know what concupiscence means and what a, a carbuncle is reading here. And so the best Bible that you will read is the one that you will read. Today, obviously, I, I preach from the English Standard Version. Fantastic translation. It's readable. It's literal. It would serve you well. If you love the King James, read it. Embrace it. If you have trouble with it, then find one. Read. Now, that's a whirlwind tour of how we got from Moses, who wrote the very first words of the Bible, to where we are today. But I hope that you see that this book is the Word of God. But if God is giving us His Word, God is writing to us in the Bible. This is the Word of God. What's God talking to us about in the Bible? What's He actually saying to us? Well, Paul tells us that too back in 2 Timothy. Divine source of the Bible, but he also talks about the dynamic, really should have said dramatic subject of the Bible. He says, Timothy, from childhood, verse 15 of 2 Timothy 3, from childhood with the sacred writings of the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. What is the message that God wants the world to hear? What is the message of this book that is sitting in your lap right now? Or maybe laying on your coffee car. What is the message of this book? Paul says, Timothy, the message of this book is saved by faith in Jesus. That is what God is saying in this book from cover to cover, in every chapter, every law, over and over and over again. God is subject, and that is Jesus. So know today that this book is about Nine chapters, 30, 73 verses, page after page. It is about Christ. Ancient poetry of the Psalms and Song of Solomon to the Proverbs, to the history of the Jewish people, to the prophecies in the Old Testament, to the record of Jesus in the Gospel, all the way through the pastoral and personal epistles. They are all pointing us to one person. So that this book that was breathed out in inspiration from God, it is a living And if you took its pulse, its pulse is the gospel of Christ. So, understand, understand this today. Some of y'all up bad, so hang with me. The Bible is not about you. Well, that went better than I thought. That was the whole rest of the sermon, so we just pray and go home now. Very first verse of Scripture where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible tells you who it's about. It's about a God, a God who saves, a God who creates, a God who judges, a God who makes promises, and then a God who gives law, a God who governs all things, a God who sends his son to die and brings him up out of the grave and saves his people through that son. And even Jesus himself said in John chapter 5 to the Jewish people who thought very He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. In other words, you think that you have eternal life just because you have a Bible. But he said, it is they that bear witness about me. Jesus said, that book you're reading, he said, it's all about me. He says, but you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So that this book has one goal, that is that you would know Christ. It has one theme, it has one story, it has one hero that runs through every promise, every law, every battle, every command. It is Jesus. This book was given so that you would know Him, so that you would see Him, so that you would trust Him, so that you would follow Him, and so that you would love Him because you would learn how much He loved you. So the Bible is not about you, but it is for you. It is for you. And this confusion really is the reason some of you maybe don't engage with the Bible the way you know you need to. Because you've always thought of the Bible as a rule book. The Bible just tells you all this stuff that you're supposed to do. It tells you all these commandments you're supposed to keep and principles you're supposed to live by. Or it's this book that's full of all these Old Testament examples of people who did great things that you're never going to do. I mean, you're never going to do the fiery furnace thing or the lion's den thing. Let's get real. You're never going to do that, right? I'm not either. And if there's a short list, I'm not signing up to do it. And so we read all this stuff and, and we think the Bible is irrelevant to us. We think that the Bible is boring because of all this stuff that it has. But friends, the Bible is not a book merely of good advice. It is not merely a book of good examples. Good news. The good news that is wrapped up in a person. So think about what happens to me if I read this book and I make it all about me. 
For one thing, it's going to crush me with all these demands I'm never going to be able to fulfill. Laws I can't keep, heroes I'll never be like. I'm reading about a bunch of promises, Babylonians, and what does that have to do with me? And so the Bible becomes really boring and really irrelevant. And if I read it and I put myself as the hero, this is, every bit of this is all about me, then I'm going to misinterpret the Bible in the most ridiculous and crazy ways. And that's what's happening in many places in our culture and churches today. People are misinterpreting Scripture because they haven't learned to read about Jesus in Scripture. When Jesus himself said, look, it's all about me. Let me give you an example of how we do this, all right? This will be quick and easy. Most of you know the story of David and Goliath. I hope you do. If you don't know the story of David and Goliath, it's in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 17. David's a shepherd boy. People of Israel are fighting the Philistines. Goliath is this big, tall giant, almost 10 feet tall. He's threatening everybody, making this big scene, mocking God, mocking the people. David takes a slingshot and kills Goliath, and everybody lived happily ever after. That's the version. And so, how do we talk about that story in church? How do we read that story? Here's what we do. We say, look, you got giants in your life, don't you? you got obstacles at work, and... If you just be like David and live by faith, you can overcome those things. And we look at it and we say, well, you know, you got obstacles in your marriage. you got this hard patch you're in, and God can conquer that giant, and you can live in victory. But I want you to know today, that story is not about you. What is the story of David and Goliath, really? That is the story of a shepherd king who's on his way to a throne, who stands in alone for his people, who are too afraid and too useless to fight their enemy. And so David, by himself wins a victory as a substitute for his people so that they get to enjoy the blessings of a victory they did not fight for and did not win. Does that sound familiar to you? Jesus. It's the story of how Jesus gives us victory that we did not fight for over our truest and deepest enemies. And I wish we had time today and I could go through story after story in the Bible and show you these stories are pointing us to Jesus. They're all about him. Maybe I should just do that and we'll cancel church tonight. I don't know. But that's what the Bible... So there's no quicker way for you to ruin the Bible and to make it descend into irrelevance in your life than to try to make it all about you. Because you're going to read something in the Old Testament about how the Old Testament Jews couldn't eat crawfish. And you're going to think, what in the world is that doing anything? Stuff about Cyrus the Persian. You think, what does that have to do with me? I don't care about Cyrus. Speak to me. You may not need necessarily. Old Testament Jews could not eat shrimp and crawfish. But you do need to know that God is a God who gives laws that condemn all of us, and that we need to be saved from God our judge. You may not need to know necessarily that God uh, was doing all these things, delivering the people of Israel from Babylonian captivity, but you do need to know that when God's people at their absolute lowest, God is faithful to keep His promises to His people. And seeing Jesus on every page will help you do that. And folks, I could go on, but that, in essence, that is why I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Not because... I understand everything that I read as soon as I read it. In fact, I read some things in the book of Leviticus earlier this week. I still don't get. Don't know why they're in there. I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God because I like everything that I read as soon as I read it in this book. I don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God because I read it and it makes me feel good about myself because sometimes it doesn't. But I believe that this book is the Word of God because there are over 40 different authors writing over 1,500, different year, 1500 years. It's in three languages. And even though they're writing about different things, even though they're writing in different places, they all keep, they all keep pointing me to one compelling life, the person of the Lord Jesus. I believe this book is the Word of God because I see in it the perfect analysis of the human condition and the only hope for humanity, which is Jesus. Maybe our discomfort with the Bible when we read it should prove that it really is authentic. Let's just imagine for a moment, just take it for granted that the Bible is the Word of God. That it really does come down to us from the God who made us, who knows everything, who created us, who has a plan for our lives. Wouldn't you think that at some point it's going to say something you don't like? Wouldn't you think that at some point it's going to rub you the Wouldn't you think that at some point it might be a little bit tricky to understand? Wouldn't you think that at some point... It would come to you and tell you things you don't want to hear. And the Bible does. No man would ever. Because the Bible says that in the heart of every single human being 
are the problems that are wrong with the whole world. And that we are not going to be the ones to fix it. But that we are so hopelessly lost, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, that the only hope for us is that God would come for us. That God would come after us. Friend, that's the message of the Bible. That's what it's all about. I read this week a quote by a pastor named Aaron Armstrong. He said, it's a great way to say it. He said, it is a, the most humbling, frustrating, and awe-inspiring book you will ever read. And that is true. And it's given to you for one purpose. And that purpose is so that you would place your faith in Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation. So today, you may believe the Bible is the Word of God. You may not. You may have a lot of Bible verses memorized or not. But those things are not the same as putting your faith in Jesus. Is it possible today that maybe some of you have believed this book and been around this book your whole life, but you've never really met the one who is both the author and the subject of this book? Is it possible maybe that you've come into church today and you've heard some guy yell about a book you've never read, but maybe you've understood that you really are a sinner who needs a Savior? If so, I'm going to tell you what we could do today. We could take this book. And in just a few short lines from this book, we could tell you what it means for you to be a sinner. How Jesus saves. And what you need to do to believe in Him. So friends, I hope regularly. But I hope more than any of that, you know the author. And you know the one he wrote about. Let's stand together today. Our musicians are coming. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. I feel like the invitation should be for me to invite you to to go and read your Bible. I feel like that's what we need to do, which will probably help us. But some of you may need to come and really do business with the Lord today. And so we're going to give you a chance to do that. If I can pray with you, I'd be happy to. If I can answer any questions for you that would require something further after service is over, I'll be around all afternoon and be happy to talk to you. But friend, one thing I do know this book says, this book says to all of us, there's hope when we're at our worst. This book says to us that God keeps His promises. This book says to us no matter what our past has been and that there can be a new future no matter how it looks. This book says you do not have to leave here the same way you came. And that's because of Jesus. Kelly, let's sing.